Um, I've got a microphone here, but I think everyone can hear me quite clearly, eh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll stick with how we are at the moment. I've been had a bit of a croaky voice lately, so if I start to um, struggle, I'll put the microphone on to give me a bit of extra volume. But um, yeah, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, my name's Gareth, as Sasha has um, welcomed me to say, and I'm the biodiversity advisor at the Waitaki District Council. So I'm here tonight to um, give a speech to the Geopark. Um, I was asked quite a few months ago to do so, and then COVID restrictions and other things um, put this off for a while, which was great because gave me a little bit more time to prepare, and I'm slightly prepared, I suppose, through having that extra time and being in the job and understanding more about um, the biodiversity of Waitaki um, within that time. So um, I came up with a... I had a short space of time at that time to come up with an idea for what I'd talk about, and so... What I put forth at the time, which is something that's always um, the heart of the environment, I suppose, and what biodiversity is at the core of, is the concept of everything is connected, and um, that's commonly presented today in the form of kiutiki tai, which is a traditional concept um, describing the path, the flow of energy, I suppose, and the connection between systems from the mountains to the sea. And also back to the mountains again from the sea. So um, it's that cycle and it's that connectivity. And so I think to understand biodiversity and our environment and to understand how to look after it, um, understanding that connectivity and the, the connections is really where we need to go. So who am I? Ko Waio. Um, I work for the Waitaki District Council as the Biodiversity Advisor and I sit within the planning team there. So it's a new role to me, I've been in there for half a year or so now. Um, and it's part time so I don't get to delve into it as deep as I'd love to. I'm sure there's scope for there to be a um, couple of full time jobs within the field of biodiversity within Waitaki. Um, <laughs> but there, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting space to be. And, I've really enjoyed being within the confines, or not confined, but um, within the realm of the planning team because it's an opportunity to understand what's going on within the development within the district and to um, offer support to the planners to be able to put in um, ideas for landowners, developers um, within the developments to do some things that could be of benefit to um, the wider world in the form of biodiversity. So it's, yeah, that's me in my working role. Um, Ko Waio, people may recognise this place. This is where I come from, where I was born and raised. Anyone know that town? Hamilton. Yep, it's Hamilton, Kitty Kitty Door. So I grew up on the very outskirts of Hamilton um, in the 80s, and I spent a lot of time roaming around within the wild areas of that city, but that was my wild expense, and um, my parents were avid workers so I um, got a lot of free time to myself after school where I'd go roaming around in our parks and, and all the um, interesting places near our house and so I had a um, developed a real affinity I guess with the nat natural world and biodiversity through my um, upbringing and, my, and I was a scout and my parents were um, outdoors people that would take us tramping in our holidays and touring around the country so but that's sort of where I grounded myself and then um, I went on a student exchange to Norway for a year and studied environmental planning at university and got a completely different perspective on the world, I guess, from my upbringing as a um, suburban kid in Hamilton um, through education and opening my eyes. And so um, when I was at university, I, was, I had a real dream of wanting to work in conservation world, work for the Department of Conservation. Um, and so, and I also, after spending a year in Norway, which is a really interesting and progressive country, um, had developed a bit of a dislike for New Zealand, I suppose, during my university rebel times and the systems and the way that things were going here. And so at the end of my um, time of study, I left the country again and went off overseas to try and find whatever it was I was looking for. And um, while I was over there, there was a new course started up in Nelson, which was the trainee ranger course, so um, I found that really interesting as an opportunity to get into that world of conservation work that I um, had dreamt of, and I applied for and got into that course, which was great. And so we had a year there, which was, it was an amazing course, and a few, I think it's still running um, through Nelson, and so 
if you ever have any youth or even young adults um, or older adults we had in our course as well that were interested in getting into that world, it's a really cool way to get into it. It's a great course with all sorts of practical and um, a lot of theoretical backup to that practical work that you do within it. And a small team of people working together and you have heaps of fun. So, um, After that world, I ended up in this world, which is Te Uri So I lived in a little town called Mirupara for the last 15 years before I moved down here. And that's um, up in the Whirinaki Forest, right on the edge of Te Uri what was formerly the National Park there and now is just known as Te Uri Wera. Um, and so I spent that time, first eight years I spent working for DOC and... I, my job was monitoring the outcomes of the um, biodiversity work that happened within the area. So we covered all of the Bay of, well, all of the sort of central and eastern Bay of Plenty at the time. And so I helped out with a lot of um, bird work and lizard work, and we'd spend a lot of time on interesting islands and get around the place. And it was a really wonderful job. And it was at a time when Doc was going through changes with lots of restructures and all that sort of thing and after eight years I was pretty sick of the um, political side of it within that system and so um, left working there. Um, but it was a great time because it taught me a lot of skills and, and gave me the opportunity to really get involved with um, some really special things that a lot of people never get the opportunity to even see let alone um, be up there touching and getting paid to wander around in the bush and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, it was awesome. And that's, this is Roger's hut, which is an old deer stalker's hut um, up in the bush there. And it, when I was first working there, they were just looking at potentials to set up programs to protect some of that bush there. You can see it's pretty hammered um, through a lot of the dead treetops throughout there. And it's also in a really good state through a lot of the live regeneration that's coming through in that photo. So it tells you a bit of a story about um, biodiversity here as it is. Now they've got thousands of hectares of stoke control within that area and it gets managed for um, possums and all that sort of stuff um, because of the changes that have happened over time with increased funding and knowledge about the gains that can come with that type of work. Okay, so that was me and I lived in a really cool little community. Um, about 1,300 people that were um, predominantly Māori and totally connected to the forest and a lot of people spend most of their time in the forest gathering um, food to bring back, food and resources and growing other resources to um, bring back into their community. But it was a real connected bunch of people that um, taught me a lot about the, the land and the things that live, with, live upon the land. And so after I left Doc, I... Um, Ended up working for a time for a contractor travelling around the country, measuring carbon in 20 by 20 plots, um, and we had a contract measuring the scrub plots throughout the country. So on an 8 by 8k grid, there, wherever there was scrub fell on this point within the 8k, 8 by 8k grid of the country, we had to go in there and um, measure the scrub within there. So a lot of it was gorse, other stuff was beautiful regenerating native forests, and other stuff was alpine shrublands. But it was a really cool opportunity to learn a lot about how our ecosystems work so it was a really wonderful job hard work and our boss really drove us and we um we were all completely burnt out by the end of the contract but it was a really wonderful experience to learn about how different things grow in the wild scenario and how they contribute to soil and um biodiversity in general and how different types of practices can have different types of effects on the land i suppose so it opened my eyes a lot to um, a lot of things that, within the confines of DOC, I'd quite often had a closed-off um, perspective towards. Sorry, I keep going to push on to the next slide, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, so then from there, I was lucky enough to get um, called up from a mate who I used to work with at DOC to come and work in another organisation, um, and that got me out of having to race around the country living out of a little Suzuki um, wagon, and so I went to a place called Te Whareawanga or Awanui Arangi, which is one of the Whareawanga or Māori universities um, that are predominantly in the North Island, although they also operate down here. And I started teaching within the Environmental Studies degree, which is um, I was teaching ecology and water management and all sorts of random things that they ended up putting me onto. But that opened my eyes to a whole different world, which is Mātauranga Māori. And although I'd lived within a Māori community, um, and spent a lot of time with most of my friends were Māori. The academic world of Mātauranga Māori was a whole new awakening for me, and the, the unlocking of the 
the secrets, I suppose, that we were trying to find out within that world of conservation in order to um, overcome some of the problems that we were facing in the world suddenly became quite obvious to me as to um, how some of these solutions could be quite easy to come by. So that was me, and then um, from there, my well, at the time my wife was running a cafe and she was um, working really hard and then looking for an easier option to work for someone else, I suppose, and started applying for a few jobs, and she got a job down here. So um, she's an environmental advisor at the McRae's Gold Mine for Oceana Gold. So we came down to check out the area um, before she accepted the job, and we decided, well, North Otago is actually a pretty amazing and um, beautiful place, and it has a whole lot to offer. So we, even though I thought I'd never leave Murupara, we ended up on a big journey um, travelling down here at the beginning of last year. So we now, when I'm not in my part-time job as a biodiversity advisor, I'm at home looking after that little guy there, who that's a year ago, because... Um, I haven't got any recent photos of us in there, but we have a little peony farm just out of Waianakarua, so um, just north of Hamden. So, um, yeah, got an acre of peonies there that's keeping me really busy at the moment. And um, when I'm not at doing my normal job, I'm racing home and running up and down those rows trying to pick everything I can before they turn out looking like that. Um, but it's fun. It's a really interesting job, and peonies as a crop are uh, something I think uh, have got a great potential. They've got medicinal properties and all sorts of potentials from that side of the world as well as obviously their aesthetic qualities and economic benefits that with um, a collective of growers could help out people to have a lot more of a sustainable way to um, make an income off much smaller areas of lands than that are currently required for people to create sustainable incomes. Um, so it's been an interesting crop to get to know. I'm just, I've got a general interest in organic farming and growing food and living off the land and so we found this place that had this opportunity and so I'm learning about how to convert them into an organic crop and um, not deal with all the chemicals and things that are often used within the flower industry that we obviously with having that little fellow there wandering around in the rows with me we definitely don't want to be using um, in our world. So yeah, back to um, my talk, that's me. Um, so we're talking about the biodiversity of Waitaki and, and especially in reference to how it fits within the geopark. So um, this is really my impression of the geopark in Waitaki. And this is the, the traditional knowledge of de a description of the area. So um, the original peoples, the Waitaha, the Rapuwai, the Katimamoi, and the Naitahu are the people that have um, sculpted this knowledge of the land. And um, I pay respects to that. Through my wife, we uh, connected through Moiraki Marae, and it's a really wonderful... Um, Hapu to be learning more about our connections and spending time with, and very different to uh, the hapu that we lived with up north um, in Murupara and my sh wife Charlotte's other whanau um, around the east coast of New Zealand. And so, and really beautiful, um, sad as per everywhere, but really strong history and strong connection to the land. And the people here were really amazing because they were able to live um, and base themselves out of one small part of the area and utilise massive areas and go on massive journeys in order to be able to um, sustainably manage the land. So Kātiritiri Moana, the Southern Alps. Um, from there flows Waitaki Kāroi Mata Aoraki, which is the river, and it flies down to Te Taiwaraituru, which is the coast where Araituru used to uh, move across. So this is Kātiritiri Moana at the top, flows through down this river, um, and then obviously out to this coastline here. So it's a really interesting and um, diverse landscape that's very much, all of the life that lives within it is very much connected to the geology and the sculpting of the land that has um, created the landforms that we have here. Okay, so what is biodiversity? How I see biodiversity, it's the children of the people that created the biodiversity. So it's ka tamariki a tāne, a takaroa, a roko, a haume, tiki tiki. So those are the gods, the children, some of the gods, some of the children of Rangi and Papa, Raki and Papa down here, that um, gave birth to and created, I suppose, um, some of these species. And it's interesting when you look from a scientific perspective, looking into evolutionary theory and... Um, DNA connection as to how some of the ancient corridor around 
whakapapa lineage, which brings different species to be connected to each other, is actually fairly in line, and there was some really interesting knowledge that um, science is only really verifying um, a lot of ancient knowledge today. And so Tane, um, as people would know, is the god of the plants and the animals of the land. Takaro is the god of the plants and animals of the water. Roko um, looks after the cultivated crops, which are the areas where we live and the places which we manage, which equally have their part within the realm of biodiversity. And Homi Tikitiki looks after the wild gathered crops and is often associated with places like wetlands that, and these wild crops that um, are part of the sustenance of the environment and currently are probably in not such a good a state of um, affairs. <coughs> okay, and so that biodiversity fits within the Taiao, the coastal, the coast to the world, which um, is effectively the coast of the mountains, and that's another form of um, linguistic use that connects that kiu to kitai, and that everything is connected. So we've got a whole lot of unique environments within the Waitaki. Some of those environments are only found within Waitaki, and they um, range from very micro habitats to major habitats. And um, there's certain parts within this district that are in not such a good state and other parts within this dis district that are uh, something to really be excited about the state that they're in and relative to other places. Okay, so we have the mountains, Kaumoka, and within those environments there's um, all sorts of different vegetation types and spe specialised animals that can live within those environments. We've got our rivers that flow from them, the awa, we have our wetlands, the repo. So our wetlands are in a, one of those um, examples of environments that are in a bit of disrepair within the country. Um, throughout certain parts of the country, there's only 2% of the original wetlands left. And wetlands are that sponge, that buffer between the land and the water that makes everything um, be maintained in a healthy state. They're effectively the lungs in some ways of the land itself. And so by reducing... 98% of them in certain areas, um, we end up with a really dangerous situation where the water becomes really unhealthy and then that has a flow on effect throughout all life that it connects with, especially us. Um, so in Otago, we've actually got the best statistics of any region within the country for wetlands and only 75% of the wetlands have been destroyed here. Um, so there's, we've still got a quarter of them left. So Relative to other areas, there's still some okay situations there, and that means that there's obviously a lot easier opportunity here for us to um, to be able to restore some of those situations. And so obviously there's cumulative effects with hydrology when you start to destroy wetlands and remove the water from them. And if you've got a quarter of them left, it's going to be easier to bring back more than it is in the places where they've only got 2% of them there. So there's a lot of work going on around in that realm, and some interesting stuff too and um, maybe be more. So we also have some really special environments um, within this district in the form of the lakes, Karoto. So we've got obviously Oho um, up in the top and some of the alpine tarns which are very um, yeah, special and unique environments that are um, really interesting within themselves. And then downstream of that we have all of these man-made lakes as part of the Waitaki Hydro Scheme which now are also hotspots for biodiversity and they're home to many threatened species that can't find homes anywhere else because of the fact that we remove 75% of the um, vegetation in areas where they would normally find homes. So um, we don't just need to look at the natural environments in order to um, understand biodiversity and sometimes learning from the artificial environments can be a really good thing to um, look into because that can help us understand how to what types of processes are happening that we could enhance within some of those natural environments where we're having problems as well. Um, and then we have the Pākehi, the dry land, so obviously that makes up a large part of Waitaki. Um, we've got the yeah, dry tussock lands from the top, they consisted of scrub and tussocks, the Pākehi, and they're very different now in our mindsets to what they were um, in the days of first European contact and prior to um, the conversion of the land for farming. And so they've had massive impacts from animals changing there, so ungulates and grazing animals changing the nature of what types of plants grow within them. 
and um, they're quite barren relative to how they would have been once upon a time, even though the landscape in earlier times was regarded as barren. And the Pākehi are mostly um, a human-induced landscape. So they were originally there were forests that were lost through um, different natural events prior to Māori coming, but enhanced through Māori management of the land through burning over time, and obviously living in this type of environment where it's can be very hot and dry, and we've seen that in recent times with some of the horrible disasters that have happened with regards to fire. Um, fires can go out of control and big areas can be burnt. And so um, the Otago Regional Council has done some interesting work on mapping potential ecosystems that were once within the whole, uh, within the region. And one of the most interesting things I came across is that the whole place at some point in time below... 1100 metres and 900 metres nearer to the coast where you get that cool coastal influence are, um, were once forest and there were podocarp forests right throughout these areas and there's a whole lot of information through geological records, pollen records and um, information that's been learnt through different forms of research that says that this place was once an abundant forest with large areas of wetlands on the plains and the supporting plants that went with those. So. It's really interesting to know that now we've got this completely different environment and through ongoing burning through natural and human um, causes, the tussock land has actually encroached from the mountains and made its way right down to the coast in areas throughout the Waitaki. So um, we've got a really unique um, bunch of ecosystems and species that live within those ecosystems that have evolved, mostly evolved throughout the natural times of burning and more recently through um, that have been able to become... Um, the remaining species through the ongoing human burning that happened. Okay, and then we went and changed things entirely through the modern technological processes of um, farming and urbanisation and a lot of the things that we've done. And so now we've put a whole load of extra pressures on them. And those um, effectively invasive ecosystems that came down that were the tussock lands are now relatively threatened in a lot of ways. Um, so it's really interesting. But those are something that we're really proud of within the Waitaki because of um, their uniqueness and it is pretty unique for the tussock to be coming to the sea which it um, is in parts of our district. So we also have interesting environments within the toka which um, certain areas like Macraes and up into the mountains these are the rocks, that, the rock stacks that come out of the ground and there's a whole lot of creatures that are only found connected with those because they provide a refuge and a food system and probably some type of water capture type process happening within the environment that um, allows those species to exist. And we have a very limited number here compared to what I'm used to um, from where I've come from before living in the middle of the forest. Um, but there's forests here and some really significant forests within the district and some of them, especially some of the remnants near the coast, um, are of extreme significance because there's, they're in the situation in Otago where there's less than 2% of the original cover left of the coastal forest. And so um, that buffer between the ocean and our activities on the land is obviously removed. And you can see from that um, photo I had up earlier of the Kākanui coastline there, we don't have a lot of a buffer protecting what we're doing here on the land um, with what's going on in the sea. And so we have massive problems with erosion along the coast. And... Um, Species like the takaraka, the yellow-eyed penguins, are struggling to find habitat within tiny little um, remnants of bush, and therefore they're in a not a good state, um, as well as all the problems they're having within the ocean, with food supply and pollution, um, but they're also not even able to find much of a habitat to be able to nest in. So there's a lot of opportunity where we can fix up a lot of those processes relatively quickly by just changing how we operate on the land. Um, and then we're off to the ocean itself, which, as I said, it's in a um, you know it's a beautiful ocean here. We've got a, some really interesting stuff happening within the ocean zone with um, marine protection in Otago, and that's got a lot to do with the influence of Naitahu and the local runanga. Um, and we've got kelp protection beds. We've got ma tai 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 apuri that are um, protecting those a lot of the resources that are found within the sea as far as food goes, and there's a, a quite a direct connection between the um, 
conservation efforts that are happening within that realm as well and the people that are, have been driving a lot of that policy. So it's quite an interesting zone down here compared to a lot of the country where I think we're in, it's another 2% or somewhere around that realm of our marine areas have any form of protection over them. And so therefore our marine ecosystems are um, have potential for threat from the just from that point of harvesting, which is virtually non-existent on the land and the issues that come on the land. But then we also have climate change and issues of potential, um, well, we're heading in the direction of ocean acidification, and um, that's pretty scary, so I'm not going to delve into that in any way, but it's a really interesting topic. But there's quite a potential that um, we could have total collapse in the relatively near, within our lifetimes even, um, of our ocean ecosystems that's happened in the past, and that's how we've had some of these sites in the geopark form through... Um, big events that have caused mass die-off, that have caused a whole lot of um, accumulation to happen and form sedimentary layers within the ocean. So it's an interesting scenario. We've got all these unique environments, but they have um, they have all got their issues that they deal with. So yeah, within these environments, we've got unique species. I've just taken put some photos up of some of the plants I've seen here, and um, a stolen one of a Otago skink up at McRae's. Um, so a lot of these unique species that we have here are those such as our dryland species of plants that are connected with limestone and other rocky types of sites. And so these are the remnants that evolved and managed to um, um, create their own niche within this landscape and within the unique ecosystems of the landscape. And so the geoparks are a pretty cool concept and I was really... <coughs> Another one of the reasons I really enjoyed the idea of coming to this area was when I saw um, the concept of the geopark coming forward because I think it's a great way to incorporate knowledge into what's happening on the land and often within um, the conservation world where we're looking at biodiversity we look at it totally connected only to the living things and ignore the influences of the land around it and often that can be where we will get the greatest knowledge of what's going on in order to be able to help out or improve those systems. Um, so yeah, there's issues with isolation, fragmentation, both temporal, so over time we've had times where things have been isolated through um, different climates over time. We've gone through cold and hot periods in the past. I mean, this one of the speakers um, gave a really interesting talk about the old lake that covered the a lot of central Otago and, and Waitaki prior to the Kakanu Mountains being uplifted and um, the flamingos and palm trees that were um, resident there at that time. So obviously we have a lot of change within our systems that happen and as time goes on these things change and some, some things come and some things go. Obviously we're in a state of time now where lots of things are going and very few things are coming um, other than those things that we choose to put in here. So those, those special species of here have adapted to the climate and geology of the district. Some have gone, some are in a perilous state, and some are doing relatively well and hanging in there. So it's quite interesting. So biodiversity is a, an all-encompassing word that encompasses all life, and um, we often hear about the great problems, but there are some good stories going on as well at times. So maybe we can learn a little from that. A lot of these species that ha have evolved so um, in sync with these unique ecosystems are now um, really in a perilous state and likely to continue in that state until they're gone because of the, the fact that these unique ecosystems that they've evolved within are disappearing as well at the time. And that can be through all sorts of different changes, uh, most of the time um, through the impacts of what we're doing on the land. Um, so, yeah, these species, there's a little... Gentian, which is um, in the bottom left of the screen here. That's a um, rare flowering plant that's in some of the limestone sites. The plant that's growing around, it's called Hyraceum, and that's one of the worst um, weeds within our district, especially in the drylands, because it grows as a flat weed and completely covers the ground and prevents having that open, disturbed type of soil where a lot of our native species will um, germinate. So... Um, you hear if it's about wilding pines and all sorts of other um, large-scale um, invasive plants that people are battling, but the list goes on once we've got through each of these battles, and it's, it's quite um, daunting.
daunting when you're involved in that type of work to see ever see the end of it. Um, so yeah, so our current state, you can see it on the map there. Um, from up just to the southeast of Oho, we've got large areas of this valley that was um, the heart of the drylands now that through the provision of water have been able to change their environments into quite intensive farming. And so we've got all these green circles that you can see from space um, dotted all over the land throughout those valleys there. The entire area from the foothills to the coast is virtually changed. Um, it's green where it once would have been brown. And um, where it wasn't brown it would have been forest. And not the black forest which is planted pine forest. Um, the only remnants of forest other than up in the headwaters in those dark patches near Oho um, are really these little gullies through in here within this whole district. And as we head further south to the Pleasant River where the district comes to the boundary, it's exactly the same. And so, um, yeah, it's said that we're in a biodiversity crisis. People have probably heard that um, type of comment and I assume that's pretty, there's no way you can really dispute that. Um, we've had more species disappear in the last 50 years than we have in any other period of um, time that humans have been around. So, yeah, I think we've got, as far as plants go, we've got a little under 3,000 native species of plants, and we now have over 5,000, I think, um, naturalised species of plants, so introduced ones that grow by themselves out in the wild, and that's because we've got such a hospitable climate. We're within latitudes that um, allow for things that um, allow for... A, a whole load of different species that come from a whole um, spread of different latitudes around the world to be able to acclimatise themselves to here. So we've got a favourable place for all creatures, including humans, obviously, to establish themselves in. Um, so we've had a loss of mahina kai, and this one, to me, you'll see me um, use this word. So mahina kai is the, just the term or concept that Māori use around the gathering of natural resources. So it's can be the gathering of food or it can be gathering of other um, resources that are part of life for um, preparing and looking after your food or your house or um, clothing. So mahinga kai is really an interesting one for me because um, the, it, as I said I spent a lot of time working within DOC and we spent a lot of time carrying out research on the land trying to learn a lot about what was going on and um, the state of the forest etc. And then I also went into a different world where I learnt about how people are connected to the world through um, the whenua, through mahinga kai. And the people that were connected through mahinga kai tended to have the best understanding of what was going on in the environment because on a regular basis, over hundreds of years generally, they had knowledge of the population changes within whatever that species was that they were harvesting and there was multiple species that they were looking at. And so there was a general knowledge around the changes over time with decreases, and there was also a knowledge around other things that had increased. And so the stories of what you connect to as far as food goes um, were kept by people, so that history was understood really well. And I think it's worth supporting and um, encouraging mahinga kai, and, and that's from all people to be able to get out there and sustainably harvest foods following really strong principles and processes that don't allow for exploitation, um, as those people are the people that will understand what's going on in the environment best, because there, there's a certain excitement and memory that comes with connecting with um, hunting and fishing and gathering flax in order to make a um, korowai for your fun or something, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so the, other, the next state that we're in, our ecosystems are disconnected. So we've got, if you added all of these forests together that we've got throughout the area, we've got a decent chunk of forest, but they're all spread all over the place and the ability for the critters, the birds and the other um, mobile things that live within those areas to actually expand into a population that fits over a large area of bush that they'd all combine to isn't there because they can't get from one patch to the next. And so by having that disconnection, we lose a whole lot of um, potential for population densities of some of our natural species. And um, there's theories around surf um, 
the perimeter of a block relative to the area of a block, that means that most of these, very few of these forests here, and of, even of um, a lot of our other ecosystems within here, have a long distance from the edge into the centre of it. And so you don't have much opportunity for things to have a real refuge in the middle of a, a larger habitat. So we don't have kiwi, weka anymore. A lot of the birds that are um, connected to forests are just gone from the Waitaki. And that's kind of um, pretty sad, really, in a lot of ways. So there's, but there's potential to bring them back. There's a lot of knowledge been gained in, um, over recent years as to how we can do that. Um, so, yeah, there's other things that are happening. We have changes in policy and new directions. So people have woken up after 50 years of greenie protesting and all that stuff going on. Um, people are finally starting to put it into policies in quite strong ways and some really interesting changes and some really interesting times ahead. There's a focus on preventing further loss and enhancing what remains. And the government um, has been starting to put large pools of money towards funding people to um, start to carry out work on their land to work towards enhancing biodiversity. Um, where that is and how that comes through to here is it's all, all sorts of games go on with that. But there's a lot of things happening now that wouldn't be happening as far as projects go if it wasn't for a lot of these changes in um, government direction with funding. So. The current focus um, is being driven by national policy direction changing and it's guiding local changes. Um, so up here I've just put, these are some of the main documents that are really overriding a lot of what's happening at the regional and local level at the moment that have come out this year. So we've got this new biodiversity strategy, Te Manoa Te Taiao, and we've got the draft national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity which is a, a policy. So we've got a strategy and then the policies that come through underneath that that are guiding how regional councils and us as the district council and other district councils um, have to deal with biodiversity and fit that within their realms. It's re they're really interesting. They're all available off the DOC and Ministry for Environment websites and worth having a look into. But some of the um, most interesting stuff that's come out of, for me, I was like, whoa, when I read Te Manawa Te Tau, this is going to shock everyone. Um... But the, whole, the majority of the focus of Te Manawa Te Tai, this biodiversity strategy, is around um, fixing up some of the problems that have happened through the time since the Treaty of Waitangi was um, written. And so there's a real drive and power within Mātauranga Māori to um, connect some of that knowledge into helping drive and, um, and guide how we look after our biodiversity. So this is the... I won't go through it all, but as you can see, there's these overarching um, policies and directions and organisations. Um, people would have heard of Predator Free 2050, which is a big ambition. I hope they don't get rid of all predators by 2050 because we've got falcons and kahu and all sorts of wonderful predators. I don't really like that name, but it's a great driving concept to get communities together. Heaps of potential within this community that we could um, bring something together to to have a local project where... Um, local volunteers work together and we've got small projects happening all over the place that have a lot of potential to um, come together and do some good things. But yeah, the people and the businesses and the organisations um, the, are at the roots of the situation and they're looking at flourishing biodiversity through that So I thought I'd put that up there because it is a really good depiction of what's within that massive document um, and it's all about connecting people, um, Yeah, the guidance of traditional knowledge and also modern scientific knowledge. Um, it's recognising things like climate change and the current states of, of how the landscape is and how we need to actually do some quite um, different things in order to be able to move forward rather than trying to carry on doing exactly the same thing and hoping something different will happen as a result. So under that, within um, the Waitaki District, we have, and it's out of date now, but it's in, um, I think it's in the interest that we're going to be updating that soon, um, but it's really relevant and it's, a really, it's still active and it's a really good strategy from everything that I've seen with it, and um, I, that was one thing that interested me in the job was, that was the main bit of research that I did prior to the job was reading that, and I thought, well, that's actually a really good strategy, and there's a lot of potential there that good things can happen, and it's dealing with supporting private landowners generally and community groups um, and coming together to have good outcomes for biodiversity. So the vision is that the Waitaki community values and cares for the district's indigenous biodiversity and accepts the shared responsibility to work together 
to ensure it's sustained and enhanced both now and into the future. And as a result, there's a full range of healthy ecosystems stretching from the mountains to the sea, Kiutiki Tai, reflecting the unique and diverse natural character of the Waitaki district. Our indigenous biodiversity is an integral part of our everyday lives and landscapes. It complements the productivity of our sustainable economy and working lands, mahikakai values and sustainable harvest. So for me, that's sort of what, um, what we should be doing. So it was like, oh, well, this is a great strategy. And a lot of, although there's an update likely to happen, a lot of it will stay um, very much the same and just a lot of the actions that need to be um, carried on will potentially change. And so there's four goals which are to, these are our specific actions, so identifying the state of indigenous biodiversity in the district because a major issue we have is knowledge. Um, as with most of the country, we're still learning about what we have out there and the states of what they're in, which is why every year we learn about more and more things being in decline because we didn't really know about them before. Um, to maintain and where appropriate enhance and restore Waitaki's significant indigenous biodiversity and to engage with landholders, Naitahu and the community to protect and enhance indigenous biodiversity and to realise support and celebrate local biodiversity initiatives. So pretty cool um, goals there and I think we've moved, um, definitely there's been some good progress in that time prior to me coming along with regards to coming towards some of those goals. So, And the more I spend in this job, the more I hear about other things that have gone on with previous um, people in my role that... Um, yeah, show that there's been some pretty cool stuff happen, and um, I look forward to getting more and more involved with action. So we've got issues to overcome. Large scale habitat loss. We saw that on the map there. It's pretty. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's um, we've got large scale habitat loss. We've got that loss of connectivity between what remains and even within the different types of environments. So like from the land to the water. There's segregation between productive and wild land use. So it's not very common to have um, working farms that also within that farming landscape are thinking about how their actions and their um, activities enhance biodiversity. Probably the best examples are the likes of the forestry organisations because they have FSC certification, sustainability type certification that um, they get to tick boxes for things that they're doing within their forests and they're long term from when they plant them to when they harvest them so it's a um, there's time for things to start to happen within there. But then when it's time to harvest the forest, um, everything's gone and all of the biodiversity that's connected within that landscape also disappears and um, hopefully there's still forest next door to it so that they can move into there. But otherwise, you can potentially have mass extinctions of indigenous biodiversity happening at every single cycle of a forestry harvest. Um, so as a way forward into the future, the Billion Trees Fund and some of this type of stuff that's enhancing a lot of these operations might be potentially causing a whole lot of um, peaks and troughs within populations to happen here. Um, obviously we've, everyone knows that we've had an introduction of a huge amount of new species, many of which have been able to naturally sustain populations that outcompete, prey upon and change the habitat of indigenous species. And a lot of the impacts of that are really, they're here to stay. I mean we look at certain um, things that are most visible within the environment, but we don't always understand the impacts of um, all of the different things that are here, and it can be easy to really focus and blame problems on all this sort of stuff, but the real issue with this is that we decided to create this parkland a couple of hundred years ago and um, try and get everything possible we could get growing from around the world growing here, and a lot of it succeeded. Um, and so unfortunately we've got a situation where there's only... Um, enough space for our indigenous species to be um, living quite happily dotted in areas that are dotted around the land and not throughout the land because we've got this overarching dominance of um, these colonial species that have colonised the land. And so another issue is lack of knowledge and that's in the state of the landscape and sustainable methods to create improvements. And there's one thing I do really enjoy about this district though is that there is a huge amount of knowledge and a lot of people are very connected to the land and I don't know if it's the cold here that makes people not want to stay inside their houses and get out and about but people are generally pretty active and involved in things that are going around. Um, the one thing I've noticed though is that there tends to be um, lots of people doing lots of things around the place and not always connection between them and that's not through 
being disconnected, but just because everyone's busy doing their thing. Um, and so I like to see the potential of my role within the council of trying to join a few of those dots together and help um, different people to be able to support each other in what they're doing. Um, yeah, and then we have, like I say, that blame culture where often people are saying, you know, it's the farmers doing this, the farmers are, no, it's the cities doing this that are causing our problems. Um, hunters are blaming doc, docs blaming hunters. We've got all this type of stuff going on that doesn't necessarily allow us to come together. And I think if we can... Um, get our heads together and overcome some of our differences, there's a good opportunity that we can learn from each other and bring some of the different skills that all the different groups have to, um, to have a better place. So yeah, ways to overcome. Ways to overcome the issues we can work. Firstly, we've got to try and reintegrate wild indigenous habitats in our landscape by working with nature. So at the moment we're trying lots of things and there's a lot of restoration projects that... Um, have a lot of success and a lot of other ones that don't have a lot of success and so where we're getting success is generally where people are most focused and watching what's happened with what they're doing and most involved and it's when um, problems start to happen within those success realms um, people realise that it's time to change things or add things to it and um, go through there so bringing some of those wild habitats into our farming landscape and our forestry landscape um, is also a really good thing and we've got this system where we're assessing significant natural areas to bring into our new district plan and a lot of them have been identified right throughout the district um, but there are a very small proportion of places and how we can um, add to those and increase those wild areas within our district um, within each person's little patch um, is the next step to how we can improve biodiversity. So. Land stewardship's a really major concept and there's a lot of people, most, most people that are living on farms and living on the land and living on their own properties and spending time at the beach and going to the forest have um, some potential to be land stewards and I think it's just a, a culture and attitude that we all need to work together and share knowledge and drive into each other. Um, understanding knowledge of the past is really important and if you can, the more we can learn about that and learn about history and in this country we've really been deprived of history with regards to what's actually happened on the land and we've, you know, wasn't many generations ago that all the history getting learnt was the history of Europe and England. Now we're starting to get more things coming into here about what's happened in this place but it's still very minimal. But, and it's because the more we learn about the history here, the people history, the more disgusted we are with our ancestors to, to what went on and um, some of the horrible stories and atrocities that happened all over the country. Um, but the only way we can get through that is by knowing about it sharing about it, talking about it and just recognising some of those things that happen because we've got a, a wonderful history as well that goes with the ugly history of the past um, and if we can overcome those bad things then the knowledge sharing can start to happen in um, a lot better ways too. Stop introducing new species and share knowledge about alternative solutions. So we're still mostly through the government um, releasing heaps of new species into the country they're through agricultural types of species, they can be biocontrol species, and we're forever trying to find new solutions, but no one's clicked that that was one of the major issues at the start, and maybe if we put a complete stop to that and just... We've got plenty of things here as it is, so um, we don't really need to be bringing more stuff in. Um, and sharing the knowledge about alternative solutions to how we can... Um, improve our land by not having to bring a new thing in from overseas by just understanding the different things that we have here and bringing back some of that old knowledge um, of land management could probably be a better way forward I think and we need to try new ways of thinking I've got a, I'm, I've got a real, like I'm an organic farmer I'm um, really into connecting to the land and I've got a real question over a lot of um, our restoration management that started off with a blanket spray of herbicide to completely destroy most of the organisms that are present within that environment and then go through and plant trees into a desert that you've created and call it a wonderful environmental outcome. Um, so I think we need to start learning and trying different things and working together to help out and it could be that farmers are learning methods with their big tractors and um, spreading seed um, using technology that's been really effective on farms to help with biodiversity outcomes it could be all sorts of different types of things going on there um, and by having a focus on mahi kakai 
soil and water to connect to the earth around us. So sometimes you can be so focused on the problem that there's no way that you can look at the solution. And so it might be that looking at all of those critters might not necessarily be the best way to deal with an ecosystem and we might have other processes that are more important to be looking at in order to start us off. Um, and that focus on makakai, if you're going out to, say, catch a fish, a tuna from the river, an eel, um, a longfinned eel from the headwaters that are rare species these days and in danger, and thanks to some of the work that's going on, there's transfers of those within the Waitaki going um, above and below the dams in order to sustain those species. But if you're going out to catch a f food to give to visitors and to feed your family, and you come home with nothing, then you're going to start being concerned with what's going on within that realm. And if you come home with um, an abundance of food, you're going to understand that there's processes happening that are good. And so you'll be able to learn from those places where um, you've got good outcomes and hopefully transfer those into places where you've got not so good outcomes. And then there's the whole thing about differences within society and working together. So obviously, um, yeah, that's of most importance. And then, lastly, really, it's just I'd like to say a bit, talk more about ways we can be involved. And I think being involved is about um, one of the best ways we can do so is just being active, getting into and supporting groups. And another one of the reasons I love coming to this part of the world, and I always say this um, to people, is that every group I go along to where you've got volunteers involved is really well represented. So we're in an area where people tend to care Compared to up north where we had a much bigger population, we'd normally have double the people at any type of event I come to here. So um, it's pretty, yeah, it's interesting. So joining those groups together, being involved and um, encouraging the young ones to get involved to it as well is, is something of great importance. So one of the things I do, I've got a young boy and I struggle to get out to anything, but luckily I made it tonight. Um, but I grow lots of plants at home and I grow plants for my garden and I grow plants for our business. Um, but because I enjoy growing plants, I also, when I'm out and about, down at the beach or into different environments, I'll collect seed and I'll just grow whatever I am and, and I record where that seed comes from so that I know what it's connected to and what type of species it is, although you generally figure that once it starts to grow. And all of those plants, I might give a couple away to people, friends that turn up, but they're destined for the likes of the yellow-eyed penguin um, sanctuaries at Moiraki and for our local community group that's doing plantings at Hamden um, because they, I look at their plantings and they wish they had more things there and I'd, I'd probably have, I don't know, 400 plants growing this year from last summer's efforts and if lots and lots of people were doing that type of thing, which has taken me no time at all and no cost either, just a little bit of potting mix, then we'd have suddenly lots of people working together to support different groups that are going on and the need for relying on funding wouldn't necessarily be the basis of what starts a program. Um, so community conservation, I think there's a lot of potential that groups um, can support the work that Doc's doing and a lot of these other groups together to come together and start trapping within the... This town here could have a whole network of traps within here that would support um, quite a decent population of our nectivorous birds like the tuis and bellbirds that um, are quite common through here, the keredu. And if people were trapping throughout here, you'd guarantee would have quite um, strong breeding populations of those birds within the area. And it's just a matter of, and then it's not a big job or a hassle for anyone, it's a matter of everyone doing their little bit. Um, understanding our consumption of unsustainable goods is a really good way we can help, and everyone's sort of in that green movement of looking at what we waste and how much we use and that impact because it's not just the direct effects of um, the stoat killing the bird um, or the deer eating the plant that are the problems, there's a whole lot of wider effects and a lot of them are connected to the way we live our lives and that's even ones that, you know all of us that are quite into the green side I suppose um, yeah so it's I think really being knowledgeable about that, um, what we're consuming and how we look after it is really important. Being active in policy, so we've got the district plan review coming up through the Waitaki District Council. There's been, there's always different um, policies coming into place within the regional and national framework, and a way you can be involved is by having your say about these um, policies when they come through. So 
reading them, getting to know what it's actually all about, being active and learning about it, and then writing and having your say, because that does get taken into account, and it can influence the direction that those policies head in. Um, and that's really critical to overarching change and why we've got a whole lot of changes happening at the moment is because of the increase in awareness of certain groups and the impacts of submissions to have an impact on policy and legislation. Um, being mindful of the biodiversity on your property and in your neighbourhood. So we've got tree lucerne at our place and this winter, um, because they've logged all these trees up on the hill and the kiddo had nowhere to sit up there, they came down to our place and we had about eight kiddo through there through most of the winter. And there's still a couple that are there, could be nesting, I'm not too sure, but they seem to be hanging around in a tree um, by themselves. So that's um, having, they don't need to be native trees, but they need to be trees that can fit within part of that system um, that can support biodiversity and understanding how they can is, can help you to improve that situation for the life on your property. Um, sharing knowledge and looking for solutions, not problems. So obviously we do that by coming to these types of things, but just talking and being involved with the groups. And experts in these fields always want to talk about what they're up to. If you go to the Blue Penguin Colony and um, talk to Philippa there, she's an amazing wealth of knowledge and she'll always share information. And same, I mean, we've got people in the room here that are experts that can um, go through that process too. So getting to know and um, just asking will get you a long way. And being, most importantly, being role models to our children and thinking about their children, I think, is the greatest um, step that we need to take because if we're thinking in that way, then we're not being as concerned with ourselves in this present time as we are with what's going to happen into the future. So, yeah, so that's me, really. Um, yes, nō reira, ka mihi ki a koutou ko huhu mai. Um, a mihi to you all. I thank you all for coming along and listening to me. I hope it wasn't too... Um, boring or distracting, um, and just finish with a whakatauki that I think is of um, great importance to how we think about the world, so it's respect to those greater beings that look after our sites, so toi tu te maroa tāne, toi tu te maroa takaroa, toi tu te iwi, so if the, um, the, the home of tāne, the forest and the plants will always endure, and the home of takaroa the waters and um, rivers and oceans will always endure, then the people will always endure too. And so, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.